Clemency for Dotson at 10. Right at 11. Age. Maintenance. Human error. Security. All factors in a crisis of confidence in America's fleet of jetliners. Good evening, I'm Ted Koppel, and this is Nightline. There was just a huge hole uh, in the plane, and uh, three or four rows of people were gone. I mean, the seats were gone, and uh, they were gone. Among our guests, a pilot who was among the survivors aboard United Flight 811 today, and a former federal safety expert and test pilot who has explored just how much stress an aircraft can take. This is ABC News Nightline. Reporting from Washington, Ted Koppel. It can't help but make you wonder about the wisdom of commercial air travel. United's Flight 811 out of Honolulu, headed for Auckland, New Zealand, was only a few minutes outward bound when two of its engines failed and a massive piece of its fuselage was ripped out of the right side of the plane. Nine passengers who had been sitting on that side of the aircraft were sucked out of the gaping hole into their deaths. Eleven other passengers were injured, but the plane, with 334 people still uninjured and safely aboard, made it back safely to Honolulu. Still, you should know that unless you travel by school bus, there is no form of transportation safer than a major airline flight. Flying is actually safer than it has been for some time. It just doesn't seem that way. We begin tonight with three sets of impressions. Those of the airline industry, its mechanics, and the traveling public. Here's Morton Dean. If you're an air traveler, there's a lot to worry about these days. And many air travelers are worried. If we knew everything that we, there was to know about what the airlines are doing, I might not fly. Well, you think twice when you see all these accidents that are happening and so on. So about my wife flying up here from Tampa, Florida tonight, you know. I'm more worried today than I was like a year ago, sure. I think anybody is, aren't they? Today, it happened high over Hawaii. The plane was at 23,000 feet when the heavens and hell converged. Scary as hell. But we lucky we were alive. The United Jumbo Jet, a 747, had just left Honolulu. Destination, New Zealand. 354 people on board. Cocktails were being served. We heard the scrap of the hissing noise. Uh, we both looked at each other and it lasted for a few seconds. And then all of a sudden, there was just a loud, you know, bang. It was just an explosion and everybody was not there anymore. The words are familiar. The fears are familiar. Too familiar these days. This is what is left of Pan Am 103. So many different things are going wrong on so many different airlines. Terrorism, Pan Am, Scotland, December 21st. Structural failure, Eastern Airlines, West Virginia, also last December. Structural failure, Aloha Airlines, Hawaii, last April. Metal fatigue, Piedmont Airlines, Chicago, January 20th. Passengers can't help but wonder whether their rights and their lives are being protected. I'd be glad to give up anything, know that I was going to get, get to where I wanted to go safely, not crash. Consumer activists complain that the FAA doesn't have enough safety inspectors, and airlines don't have enough mandatory safety regulations. I think that airline passengers, in order to be more than just pawns in the game of airline safety, need to demand uh, from the airlines and the FAA uh, a, a report or a status report on safety of the carrier and uh, if an airline is not willing to give that report to the public then you know passengers should say well I, I won't fly with you until you produce such a report the basic dilemma facing the American flyer today is they do not have the ability to ju judge the safety of the aircraft that they will be flying we are solely dependent on the companies and the government to inspect and carefully maintain these vehicles for us. If you're a member of an airline maintenance crew, the pressure's on. 
all those complaints about poor maintenance, all those problems with management. Mechanics complain government deregulation has allowed management to cut back on safety work. No question about it. Across the board, deregulation has, in fact, uh, reduced the amount of maintenance that we do on aircraft. Some experts say the early evidence suggests today's deadly disaster was caused by metal fatigue. A cargo door and part of the plane's fuselage blew off. Metal fatigue is a major maintenance problem. And that hole in the plane is in an area, Area 41, which is known for weaknesses and in need of strengthening. There have been some problems with the lower 41, section 41 as you call it, in the past. We're doing uh, currently an extensive modification to that very section. Proper maintenance has become all the more crucial because America's air fleet is aging. Average age of the fleet, over 12 and a half years old. The plane involved in today's mishap is 18 years old. Statistics indicate that safety problems occur twice as often on older planes than they do on newer planes. More important than age is the number of cycles a plane has made, the number of takeoffs and landings. Like constantly blowing up and deflating a balloon, the changes in cabin pressure put tremendous strain on the cabin. This plane had made over 14,000 takeoffs and landings. If you own an airline, you point to statistics. Statistics which indicate air travel is safer now than it used to be. Before deregulation, there were about twice as many fatal accidents per 100 million flights than since deregulation. The industry uh, is very conscious that safety is something that you always have to uh, address. It's not something you can become complacent about. The airline industry complains that it's wrong to judge the quality and safety of an air fleet by its age. The whole concept of, of an aging aircraft uh, I think is, is misconstrued. Literally over a period of, of 15 or 16 or 17 years, you will replace uh, all, tons of material uh, in, that, in an airplane, components, uh, and in fact that airplane is essentially being kept almost new uh, as, it, as it continues to uh, grow older in chronological age. United Airlines says its damaged plane had been properly serviced. Major maintenance three months ago, a routine check a week ago. Still, nine people are unaccounted for, 14 were injured. And now, the people who run the airlines, the mechanics who maintain the airlines, and the passengers who fly on them are wondering what could happen next and how to prevent it. Morton Dean, ABC News, New York. When we come back, we'll be joined by Bruce Lampert, the former, former U.S. Navy pilot who was one of the survivors of United Airlines Flight 811 today and by an expert on aviation safety, Charles Miller. This is ABC News Nightline, brought to you by Audi. Sunday on This Week with David Brinkley, the controversial Tower nomination. John Tower finally answers the charges against him when he faces the Brinkley panel, Sunday. Charles Miller is a former director of the Bureau of Aviation Safety at the National Transportation Safety Board. A former test pilot, as well as a veteran of 30 years of research on aviation safety, Mr. Miller currently runs his own independent safety consulting firm. He joins us from our affiliate, KTVK, in Phoenix, Arizona. Bruce Lampert, who is with us from our affiliate, KITV, in Honolulu, was a passenger on United Airlines Flight 811 today. He boarded the plane at Los Angeles en route to Auckland, New Zealand. Mr. Lampert, who is a private pilot, is a Denver attorney, who specializes in aviation accident cases. And I guess that's about as close to one as you ever want to come, Mr. Lampert. You, you uh, when the accident happened, the plane was at about 20,000 feet, so I gather you were, what, still trying to make altitude at that point? Just tell me what was happening. Give us a brief description, would you? That's right, Ted. Uh, we were uh, about 20 minutes out of Honolulu, and we were climbing to our cruising altitude, which was approximately 40,000 feet. Uh, we were about 20,000 feet when we underwent an explosive decompression of the aircraft. Uh, and by saying explosive decompression, um, that's a term of art. It doesn't mean that, that there was an explosive device, but rather that there was a sudden, unexpected decompression of the aircraft as a result of a separation of the skin of the aircraft. Where, um, where, were, you on the, where were you on the plane? Would you just kind of locate yourself and locate the, 
the uh, we we know that the uh, that point of uh, of explosion, as you just put it, was uh, on the right. What the right front of the aircraft? It's the right, right or starboard uh, side of the aircraft. And uh, if you're familiar with the 747, many of your viewers are. It's uh, a, an aircraft that has a main deck, and it also has a uh, um, uh, upper deck. And uh, the upper deck on this particular flight was for the business uh, uh, passengers, and I was on the upper deck in seat 7B. So you were we kind were of in that, that's, that's the area as you're looking at the silhouette mm -hmm. of the plane that has the hump there. Right, the hump in the right behind the flight crew. If you, if you recall of photographs of the accident aircraft, uh, you can see where the tear um, actually extended through the main deck and on up into the upper deck and actually perforated the, uh, the line of windows uh, in the upper deck. Uh, when the, the decompression happened, uh, it did blow out several of the windows in the upper deck. There were uh, two uh, couples that were sitting in the aircraft uh, next to the, the windows that were blown out. Um, there was an absolute uh, uh, fear. Uh, the husbands grabbed their wives, um, pulled them close to them in the inboard side of the aircraft, and there was an incredible deafening uh, sound. Uh, once the aircraft decompressed, we were no longer able to communicate in any way with our fellow passenger, the flight attendant, um, but with hand signals. Uh, and we did that. We, uh, it was a sign language of our own where we communicated very well with each other, but um, the fear that was in all of us was that another piece of the fuselage would break apart, another piece would peel back, another piece would come apart, and that another passenger would go out the, the gaping hole. Now, as you say, you were upstairs. The, the people who were sucked out of that hole in the, in the starboard side of the plane were, were downstairs. Could you see what was happening? Did you know what was happening? No. We, out in the upper deck, we could not see what was going on in the, in the lower deck, although we knew that there was a major catastrophic structural failure. Um, we had panels from the roof of the aircraft that came down um, and landed on the passengers. There was a bulkhead which was behind the, uh, um, the upper deck passenger section where the crew um, that normally, uh, if you're rotating a crew through on a long flight, has an opportunity to stay back there and sleep, that entire bulkhead collapsed inward. And uh, there was no one in those seats, thank goodness, because if they had, certainly they would have been uh, seriously injured. We knew we had a serious, serious problem. Um, in my personal experience, uh, um, having been involved in the litigation of these cases, I suddenly found myself from between being an advocate for air safety to being a potential victim. And I can tell you, it was a very unpleasant experience. Now, Mr. Milley, you're, you're the expert. You have I, I have to point out to uh, our viewers, obviously, you haven't had a chance to inspect this aircraft, but we've all had a chance to look at those photographs. Does it make any sense to you that this, uh, could it conceivably have been an explosion? In other words, I'm saying, could there have been an explosive device? Or does this just look like, like some kind of metal fatigue failure? Well, you certainly don't rule anything out at this stage, Ted, as you well know. Uh, but given the, uh, the smoothness, if you will, uh, particularly of the bottom part of the opening, uh, I don't think an explosive device would, uh, would do that unless it was a what we call a linear shaped charge, and I think that's out of the question at this point. Now, Mr. Miller, uh, I don't know if, if you can take a look at your, your monitor there. We'll put that picture up again. When you're talking about the smoothness, you mean it's almost like a cutout, right? Yes. It's a, I, I don't know the exact configuration of a, the cargo door in this area, but it's the kind of rectangular corners that you would expect to see around a cargo door. What, what is, I mean, it is your impression then that what happened? I mean, how does, how does that... How does the wind or whatever it is that pulls that out of there, how does it ever get purchase? Well, let me, let me put it this way, Ted. We've had uh, pieces of fuselage structure uh, involving doors uh, come loose before in many aircraft of all sizes, from the big ones to the little ones. And what you normally see is relatively little damage on the lower side because these things are hinged up on top. And when they tear loose on top, they tear a rather jagged, uh, they leave a rather jagged trail. Now, whether or not this uh, door opened and then peeled all the way back as, what, 27 to 40 feet or something like that, that's uh, going to await somebody's detailed look. But uh, 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 th the kind of picture I saw, except for the uh, circumferential distance, uh, could come from opening a door and having it tear off due to the wind blast. 
We, we've got to take a break in just a moment, but before we do, Bruce Lambert, just tell me, uh, the report we heard was that first the, the number four engine, then the number three engine, or it may have been the other way around, but that two engines went out. Were you aware of the engines going out? We were, Ted. Uh, um, the passengers on the starboard side, naturally, the uh, conditions of the engines were primary importance to us as we made our expeditious descent down. Uh, we, uh, those passengers on the starboard side, were reporting to the other passengers through loud uh, yelling and, uh, and talking with this sign language that they did see fire in the number uh, three engine. The number three is the one inboard on the right wing. Um, but I, from what I could see, it appeared that it was uh, more or less the debris or the for, uh, foreign object damage, the FOD as we call it, um, being ingested through the turbine engine and then being ignited as it's it exhausted. Um, but that damage, that, that FOD going through a turbine does cause damage and apparently it, it reduced the effect of the engine to the point that the pilot did shut it down. And we learned later that uh, on final approach, uh, we actually made the approach with only two, and with numbers three and four engines shut down. All right, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we'll be joined by the chairman of the House Subcommittee on Aviation, Congressman James Oberstar of Minnesota. It was again voted the best in the business in the prestigious Washington Journalism Review. Peter Jennings, best anchor. Sam Donaldson, best correspondent. This week with David Brinkley, best interview discussion program. No wonder ABC News is America's choice. We invited United Airlines, Boeing, and the Federal Aviation Administration to provide representatives to join us on tonight's broadcast. They all declined. Congressman James Oberstar of Minnesota, who's with us now in our Washington Bureau, has conducted a number of hearings on airline maintenance. He is now chairman of one of the two congressional subcommittees that oversee civil aviation. Are you seeing some kind of a pattern here? As I was saying at the top of this broadcast, it's still the safest way to travel except by school bus. But, but there is this terrible feeling as you see one or two or three or four of these in a row that something is awfully amiss, is it? Well, four years ago, I would have said that the margin of safety is declining in aviation, and it was at that time. But I think that we're beginning to see margins of safety rebuilt in aviation. Not fast enough and not complete enough. Uh, we want to see safety built to the point where we approach zero of this type of accident. And with the proper kind of maintenance by the airlines and surveillance of that maintenance by the FAA, we can approach zero. Let me put a question to you and then Charles Miller, I'd like you to address the same question. We heard someone from the airline industry, one of the representatives uh, earlier in Morton Dean's piece say in effect that because you're constantly replacing parts on an aircraft, uh, the sense was that you can keep going almost indefinitely because the, the aircraft is essentially new all the time. There's got to be a point at which you can't do that anymore. This is the most serious phenomenon and, and uh, issue facing civil aviation today, uh, that of aging aircraft. Last weekend, I flew back to my district, stepped aboard a 22-year-old aircraft, which if it had been an automobile, would have been registered in Minnesota as an antique car and driven on Fourth of July parades. But it was flying. It was an aircraft. It was well-maintained. But the phenomenon of aging aircraft does have to concern civil aviation, the carriers, the FAA, and those of us that have the responsibility to oversee them. And the question is, is maintenance being done in the proper places and sufficiently with the degree of thoroughness and the, and the degree of technical expertise that is necessary? Mr. Miller, even assuming that it is being done according to the highest standards, can you keep a plane flying indefinitely? Well, what bothers me, Ted, there's an assumption that uh, people uh, forget about when they make the statements as you refer to them. And that is the fact that you assume that you know and can anticipate all the places are going to fail. I would submit to you that an airplane is so complex that this is not the, at the level of, of accomplishment due to hu human performance limitations as much as anything uh, that you would really like to have. So at which point do you say, hey, folks, we shouldn't be trying to replace parts on this aircraft anymore? 15 well, years, 20 years, 25 years? I don't years? believe you can put a time limit on it, certainly, because the overall maintenance history and the, the type of attention paid to it by all the owners of the aircraft uh, makes the big difference. Well, but I do think this. Uh, my uh, uh, experience in this area teaches me that, that the FAA ought to certify aircraft when, for type and model when they're built 
for a specific number of cycles, and at the ex expiration of that period of cycles, that aircraft ought to be torn down and rebuilt more severely than a D-check, which is the most extensive check on an aircraft, and then recertified in the future for a lesser number of cycles, after which time, again, it should be torn down and reviewed and, and given a, a, the most thorough possible uh, check. That's expensive, it's time consuming, but it'll be safe. We gotta take well, a break. Uh, gentlemen, when we come back, I wanna go back to Bruce Lampert again, uh, the, the passenger and aviation lawyer. Uh, we'll continue our discussion with him in just a moment. Living out of a suitcase? Call a Quality Inn, hotel, or suite. You get a great deal. And whether it's Chicago or Paris, quality's always this close. Make the quality choice. Call 800-221-2222 for quality, comfort, or clarion reservations. This year, if you really want to get money back, listen to Henry Block. Go to Subaru. Get up to $1,000 back on a Subaru. You're ready to sell your house. Call Coldwell Banker. We don't just tell you we'll do everything we can to find you a buyer. We guarantee we'll use 18 proven marketing techniques to sell your home. We guarantee it in writing. And we wouldn't give you that guarantee if we weren't confident of one thing. Coldwell Banker. Expect the best. We guarantee it. A member of the Sears Financial Network. Heavy hitter from field operations takes over. Wants to move us into the Fortune 100. Tough guy. He wants to look at MIS. How many computers? How many dollars? What's the return? So I show him what we're doing with Wang. Voice response for order status. Wang integrated imaging for customer service. Field to home office integration. The numbers from the field come into the mainframe the second the books close. Consolidated financials go back to the field by the third of the month. His jaw drops. He says, well, he didn't say anything, really. He just whistled, like... We're back once again with Bruce Lampert, uh, who I should point out was not only a passenger aboard that United aircraft today, but uh, is himself a pilot, former uh, Navy pilot and an aviation lawyer. I, what you were saying before, I, I inferred from that that actually there was nothing wrong with the engines, but the debris from that door was sucked into the engines, and that's what knocked the engines out? Well, um, yeah, Ted, I, I, I agree with Mr. Miller that it's a preliminary at this time at best, but uh, it seemed obvious to me from what I saw that uh, um, the geometry of the accident sequence was such that uh, with the debris that was obviously being exited from the uh, blowout, that uh, a natural airflow current would have taken some of that um, aft and backwards and ingested into the turbines of the jet engines. And uh, a jet turbine can take an awful lot of uh, abuse, but you get pieces of certain sizes, uh, certain composition, and uh, the turbine blades will actually be destroyed to the point that uh, the engine will lose power, and then eventually the point to where it will not function at all. And uh, as that debris passes through the turbine, it'll be ignited, and uh, I believe that that's what the fire that we saw in the number three engine. We have only literally a few seconds left. Just a, a couple of Ted, comments from you, Mr. Lampert, if you would, on, on the subject. Ted, uh, yeah. Um, who's who's we, trying to... After, this is Bruce Lampert again, yeah, go Ted. Ahead. And we have a... After having litigated this and being involved in both the Northwest crash and the Stapleton crash of uh, Continental 1713, there's much discussion after any of these accidents where everybody is attempting to uh, um, set forth their best foot forward uh, as the excellent maintenance and, and the uh, excellent uh, uh, care that these airplanes are getting. But I feel compelled this evening to speak on behalf of those passengers that were with me on that aircraft. I don't think that the American flying public can accept a situation where um, you board an airplane like this 
and, uh, and, and you have a situation where, it, uh, where you come back and, and 11 of your co-passengers have died. We have to improve air safety in this country to the point that we can rely on it for safe and efficient transportation as it was designed to be. All right, Mr. Lambert, I'm afraid that will have to be the last comment on this program. Thank you and Mr. Miller and uh, Congressman Oberstar for joining us this evening. That's our report for tonight. I'm Ted Koppel in Washington. For all of us here at ABC News, good night. This has been a presentation of ABC News, where more Americans get their news than from any other source. Headline News, I'm David Goodenow. The White House is not giving up on its choice for defense secretary. Officials are looking for uh, new Democrats, a few Democrats, to save John Tower's nomination when it comes to the full Senate next week. Thursday night, the Senate Armed Services Committee rejected the Tower nomination, voting along party lines. Charles Bierbau reports a bitter battle is shaping up on the Senate floor. President Bush says he's already at work trying to save votes for John Tower in the Senate. It's not too little too late. The matter will be decided on the Senate floor. I think everybody knows I am committed uh, to John Tower. There is no fallback. There is no option. The president has said he does not want even the perception of ethical impropriety in his administration, but he rejected the idea that even the perception of Tower's personal misbehavior disqualifies him from serving as Secretary of Defense. That's not enough. That's not a fair enough or a high enough standard when it comes to the confirmation. Some White House aides have suggested confirmation of Tower is now uncertain. Bush says none of his aides ought to suggest withdrawing the nomination. And if you would put a name next to some of my staffers who are feeling this, I would like to kick some serious uh, um, um, <laughs> hide. In a brief news conference at the end of his stay in Japan, the president also said he and Federal Reserve Chairman Alan Greenspan are not that far apart in their view of rising interest well, rates. Obviously, higher interest rates are not helpful in deficit reduction. But what I would say is this argues uh, even more forcefully than I've been able to argue that we need to get an agreement on the budget. Bush met with Japan's new Emperor Akihito and said that during the funeral of Emperor Hirohito, he did think of his wartime friends who did not survive World War II. I can't say that in the quiet of the ceremony that my mind didn't go back to the wonder of it all. But Bush said it was right for him to come. Bush met with leaders from around the world and forecast one of the topics for his discussions in China. He supported an interim government led by Prince Sihanouk in Cambodia, a man he'll meet in Beijing. The goals as ever are twofold, full and permanent uh, Vietnamese withdrawal from Cambodia and the permanent prevention of a return to power by the Khmer Rouge. President Bush said he is excited about his return to China. He says there is an openness there he would not have predicted when he was ambassador 15 years ago. And the president said the U.S.-Chinese relationship is well past the point where the U.S. just plays the China card to worry the Soviets. Charles Bierbauer, CNN, with the president in Tokyo. President Bush is starting the second leg of his Asian tour. He's on his way to China, where he once served as an American diplomat. He bid farewell to Emperor Akihito and boarded Air Force One in Tokyo after attending the funeral of Emperor Hirohito. Mr. Bush said he lays in good groundwork in his introductory talks with 19 international leaders. He met with Philippine President Corazon Aquino earlier Friday and promised he would support a proposal for $200 million in U.S. aid for the Philippines. It is the oldest 747 in United Airlines jumbo jet fleet. Friday, a 10 by 40 foot section of the plane ripped open as the 18 year old jet flew from Honolulu to New Zealand. Nine people were torn from the jet, 23,000 feet above the Pacific. At least 14 people were injured. Coast Guard rescuers are looking for their bodies and debris. There were reports of body parts and clothing being found in at least one of the plane's engines. Both the engines on the right side failed. United officials are crediting the pilot with a heroic landing. United would like to express our deep admiration to Captain Cronin and his crew for their heroic efforts in safely landing Flight 811 under extreme emergency conditions. The safe return to Honolulu is a tribute to Captain Cronin's outstanding flying skill. A National Transportation Safety Board team is on the way to Hawaii to examine its 747. Mark Lev has more of the harrowing incident over the Pacific. 
The 19-year-old aircraft was climbing to cruising altitude on its way from Hawaii to New Zealand when part of the fuselage ripped open over the cargo and passenger compartments, and the pressure difference blew several passengers out of the plane. Uh, a big portion of the plane uh, disappeared. It's just an explosion, and everybody was not there anymore. Well, on the plane, did people panic? What was it like when everything scary, went wrong? Scary, scary as hell. But we're lucky, we were alive. It's fantastic. The flight crew reported problems with both engines on that side of the plane. The pilot declared an emergency and returned to Honolulu on the two left engines. I'm always amazed when an airplane comes back without a piece of it on it. So, you know, so I would say that that was a very good piece of piloting on his part. Passengers had differing recollections of what happened 17 minutes after takeoff. Travel agent Sherry Peterson, sitting right next to the hole, called her husband in Denver after the plane landed. She said there was a flight attendant that was coming through at the time that was um, pinned underneath one of the seats. It got pulled in underneath one of the seats, and Sherry said she grabbed a hold of her hand and held on to her, but she was wedged under the seats, you know, anyway, but she just held on to her until they got back to Hawaii. Nobody's completely rejecting the idea of an explosion. There's always an inference of a bomb threat. Uh, we aren't that far removed from the Lockerbie incident. And uh, I think this would have a tendency to uh, heighten that sort of speculation. But at this point in time, uh, I might reaffirm it is purely speculation. There is a report that two years ago, United's mechanics found cracks and corrosion around the pylon that holds one of the engines that failed. Metal fatigue and a faulty repair, which Boeing later admitted, caused a Japan Airlines jumbo crash in 1985 that killed 516 people, the worst single plane disaster in aviation history. The senior cabin attendant on this Aloha Air 737 died when the roof ripped off in flight. And two months ago, an Eastern 727 had part of the rear fuselage rip off in flight. Nobody hurt there. Mark Leff, CNN, reporting. A man who, who says he made dozens of trips to Nicaragua for Oliver North testified against his former boss on Friday. Robert Owen said he worked extensively with North, delivering maps, tactical advice, and money to the Contras after Congress had banned such aid. North is accused of lying to the Congress, among other things, about his working relationship with Owen. Friday, a dozen North supporters gathered outside the courthouse. They unfurled a flag and called the fired White House aide an American hero. The trial resumes on Monday. A U.S. Navy captain says he was hung out to dry, his words. Friday, a military jury in the Philippines gave Alexander Bailey in the minimum punishment a reprimand for not picking up a boatload of Vietnamese refugees. Some of the refugees reportedly resorted to cannibalism in an attempt to survive. Bailey claims he didn't take the refugees aboard his ship because he didn't realize the seriousness of their plight. Prosecutors charged Bailey and abandoned the boat people because he was in a hurry to get his ship to the Persian Gulf. The controversy surrounding Salman Rushdie's book, The Satanic Verses, is not dying down.